Elkham Way Ote Alvary K. Appleche, Ispe Umte, Uriar Ibel Bay, Ote Urspe, Orinthians K, or Teen Fe. Now, if you're new here, please don't panic. Don't start looking around for the nearest exit there in the back. In case you didn't catch it, all I was doing was using Pig Latin to say, Welcome to Calvary Chapel. Please turn your Bibles uh, to 1 Corinthians 14. And as many of you may know, Pig Latin, it's just a common name for a kid's game. And if you never learned that language, let me teach it to you quickly here tonight. Pig Latin, here's how it works. You can't say you didn't get anything from tonight's Bible study. Uh, what you do is you take the consonants off the front of each word, you stick them at the end, and you add a Y. And it's one of those things that you can learn uh, and talk behind people's back, your kids or whatever. But now my kids being in the room now know our code. So Alvary K, that's Calvary. Apple Che, that's Chapel. And then Indle K, that's Kindle. Now, some of you are saying, okay, A, Aster Pay Otske, what's your oint pay, you know? Well, this is the point, okay? I'm going to stop it now. But a simple twist of the tongue can turn a message into a mess, can't it? And can you imagine what it would have been like to sit here for the next minutes and have me do a Bible study in pig Latin? Well, some of you might find it amusing at first, but I think pretty quickly it would become annoying. And that would be confusion and chaos. It would be a mess, not a message. And see, that's exactly what was happening in the Corinthian church. It wasn't that they were speaking pig Latin. No, but they were acting like pigs. That's the truth. There was confusion. There was chaos. And instead of a message, they were making a mess. And the root of the problem, well, it was found in their tongue. That little muscle that we each have in our mouth. It got them into trouble. Has yours ever done the same? See, I've titled tonight's teaching, Tongue Twisters. And the point I want everyone to take away from tonight is this. It only takes a little twist of the tongue to mess up a message. And so just to get ourselves warmed up, we're going to try a few of these tongue twisters together. See them up here on the screen. We just need to get the blood flowing tonight. So I'll start with a simple one. Maybe we all know. She sells seashells by the seashore. Okay, here's one I found. I really like this one. A skunk sat on a stump and thunk the stump stunk. But the stump thunk the skunk stunk. Okay, let's hear it. Okay, come on. A skunk sat on a stump and thunk the stump stunk. But the stump thunk the skunk stunk. Okay, here's, a, here's another good one. This one's really good. You'll like this one. Lesser leather never weathered, wetter weather better. All right, very, very good. I heard a couple of you got it right. Oh, yeah, that's good. Okay, and then the last one, very simple, just two words. Say them five times fast. Toy boat, toy boat, toy boat, toy boat, toy boat, toy boat. Okay. Now, with that out of the way, here's what we've learned tonight. That it's very easy to trip over your tongue physically. But the believers in Corinth, they were tripping over their tongues spiritually. They were tongue twisters. And Paul gives them a bit of a spiritual tongue lashing in this chapter. And if you've been here for the... Uh, first 13 chapters of this book, you know that 1 Corinthians addresses some very tough topics. And one after another, Paul goes through them. And tonight's topic, as we near the end of this book, is speaking in tongues. Now, Pedro, you may have known uh, over the weekend, talked on tithing. And now here on Wednesday, I'm talking on tongues. So we got tithing and tongues. And you say, man, what is this? Operation crowd reduction here at Calvary Chapel Kendall, you know? Well, it doesn't seem to be working, but here's the thing. When you go through God's Word, sometimes you do hit some tough topics, but you'll see that God's Word has very clear answers to the things that confuse us sometimes. So, of everything that we could talk about tonight, well, in the Christian circles, few would cause more controversy and maybe confusion than this one, speaking in tongues. And right now, some of you are already having some questions and concerns. You're thinking, oh, I'm kind of new here. Is Calvary Chapel one of those kind of churches? You know, those churches, whatever those churches are. And others of you may be saying, speaking in tongues? I was not aware of this. What is this? I don't even know what you're talking about. Well, it's a God-given gift. One of the things supernaturally that God can give to believers, the ability to speak in a language that the person does not know 
naturally. That's what it is, supernatural speech. And I think at least on the intellectual level, we can all admit that if God could speak the world into existence, he could certainly teach somebody a language in a moment of time, in a miraculous moment. Now, here's the thing. We can start with the understanding that there is a whole continuum in the church as usual. And you know what? Sometimes the extremes, well, you can look at them and it helps you understand some of the things that are out there. There's something called cessationism. Cessationism, and that almost trips my tongue just to say it. But speaking in tongues, what they believe is that it ended with the apostolic age. Okay, As soon as the New Testament was done and the writers of that were dead, well, that's the end of that. No more tongues. No more miraculous gifts in that way. And, you know, so that means that for today, well, there's no current legitimate use of this gift. Anything that you see out there is fraudulent or maybe even demonic, you know, of the devil. And Pastor Pedro certainly addressed this in the last chapter because that's one of the proof texts. In fact, it's the only proof text that they try to use, which is 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 10. If you look at that one quickly, if it's there open on your page, it says when the perfect comes, then tongues and some other things will cease as you see there. 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 10. Now, what they uh, erroneously, I believe, say is that the perfect is referring there to the Bible. Now, the Bible is perfect, but that's not what it's talking about in context. It's very clear. It's talking about when we see Jesus face to face. It talks even about being known fully as we fully know at that time. And that's going to happen at the end of the age. That's going to happen in eternity for us. And so, we believe here at Calvary Chapel that those cessationists are wrong. They're overreacting to misuse by teaching disuse. But that's not really the right answer. And it's kind of funny. They never really think the other gifts that are lifted in, listed in the same chapter are cessationists. You know, there's the gift of helps. And you can imagine saying to one, hey, could you help me here? No, I'm sorry. That gift ended with the apostolic age. <laughs> I can't help you. I'm sorry. I can't administer this problem. No, uh, you know. That ended with the apostolic age. No, you see, in the other extreme, there's something that I would call the sensationalists. Not the cessationists, but the sensationalists. Speaking in tongues, in their view, is the only proof that you are saved and spirit-filled. And maybe you've run into one of these folks. And in these cases, many times, the churches can become a circus. Nothing more than a bunch of babbling brought about, in my opinion, by the combination of emotionalism and spiritual peer pressure sometimes. And so you see the Bible teaches neither of these two extremes. And you'll see the truth as I believe the Bible makes it very clear. Speaking in tongues is a legitimate and even desirable gift that God would give to somebody today. But speaking in tongues is not necessary as a sign of salvation or being spirit-filled. In 1 Corinthians 1230, you'll see Paul asked rhetorically, do all speak in tongues? And the obvious answer is no. Do all interpret? The obvious answer being no. And he goes on to ask other questions about other gifts. Not all have every gift. But every gift is for today. And so you see 1 Corinthians chapter 12 through 14. If you want to really study spiritual gifts as we have here, just go back and review chapters 12, 13, and 14. Maybe sit down and read it in one chunk at home. And you'll find a great biblical balance just right there in those three chapters. And you'll see that that section starts way back in chapter 12. Just to give you a quick reminder, it started by Paul saying, hey, I don't want you to be ignorant about this stuff. And yet we see so much of the confusion in the church world is simply because of, of ignorance of the scriptures that follow in those next three chapters. A simple read of those things will make these things so obvious to us here tonight. And so here at CCK, I always say, do not take my word for it. Take God's word for it. That's why we go verse by verse through it, so that you can, so that you can see it for yourself. And that brings us to 1 Corinthians 14. It's a one-stop shop for staying out of tongue trouble, and yet at the same time frees us to experience all that God has for us as believers. And so you see in verse 1 it says, Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you might prophesy. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God, for no one understands him. However, in the Spirit he speaks mysteries. But he who prophesies speaks three things you'll see here on your page. You might underline them. Edification, exhortation, and comfort to men. 
Now, stopping right there in those first three verses, here's what you're going to see. Two biblical definitions that will be crucial to your understanding of this chapter here. The first is found in verse 2, speaking in tongues. It says, that is communication with God. It's real important to see the direction of that communication. It is to God in a language that is unknown to the speaker and in most cases the hearers that might overhear. And then you see in verse 3, prophecy is communicating with people. So this is a side-to-side, peer-to-peer type of understanding here. It says in a language they all understand. Now, again, we might use the word prophecy uh, commonly in our culture to think that somebody's got the crystal ball and they can see the future. That's not how the Bible defines it really. Oh, it might have that component because God's word is supernatural and he's able to talk about those things too. But this is what it really is. It's not foretelling the future so much as forth telling the truth. It is giving God's word into a person's life to build up, as it says there, to stir up, to get people motivated to do the obedient thing, to lift people up and to comfort them when they fall. And so Paul contrasts here prophecy with speaking in tongues, and he finds prophecy to be preferable in the church. Very important that you think of that little phrase, in the church. Why? Because prophecy, see, it benefits others. And that's been the whole point, the big point of these three chapters. Others! centered living. And yet speaking in tongues benefits only the speaker, really. And so you see the first major point tonight, if you're taking some notes, our tongue is meant to bless. That's what it's there for, to bless. You see that starting in verse 4. Better wet the whistle if I'm going to be talking about speaking in tongues tonight. I don't want my tongue to stick to the roof of my mouth. Now, he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. And Paul says, I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesied, for he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues, unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. Now, what you're going to see, it's always important in the Bible when you see repetitive words. You're going to see some things and, and you want to pay attention to those things. And, and there's a repeated word here in different forms. It says edify. You see that edification. If you speak Spanish here tonight, edificio, right? That's my little attempt at speaking in tongues. Edificio. That, no, I learned that the natural way. That's the one word I learned in Spanish class. I got an F, I think. But it means to build up. It means to strengthen. That's what the word means. Building, right? To bless, that's what it means, to build something up. And so speaking in tongues is a blessing. There's not something bad about it. But here's the thing. They bless, they edify themselves. That's what it says, strengthens himself. See that in verse 4? And contrast that to prophecy where it says, you know what, that is a blessing also. The tongue being used to bless, but blessing others, strengthening others. And again, there's nothing inherently bad about edifying yourself. God wants us to be blessed, to be strengthened spiritually. Certainly we need that. And that's why he gives this gift. One of the reasons he gives this gift to believers. A powerful personal prayer language. You could see that. But again, note this. Primarily personal. That's what you're going to see in this passage. Between you and God. That's the communication line here. It's not for side to side so much. Not between you and the church. And it's not surprising that they're in this carnal church in Corinth. This personal gift that God gave for a personal reason, really. Well, it became something that was misused publicly. It became something that was abused for self-exaltation, for people to look on and go, whoa, that's a spiritual person. Do you have it? I do. Do you? No. Oh, no. And that kind of division happening in the church, showing off, acting up, that kind of thing. And so the content, it's very important to think about that in this passage. What is it? Praise and prayer. That's what you're seeing as the content of tongues. And here's the thing, verse 2 Again, I bring it back to your remembrance so that you'll know it's based on the Word of God. It says it does not, this is not speaking to men, but to God. That's the whole point of it. Prayer and praise to God, directed to God. And much of what passes as speaking in tongues in the modern church sometimes does not pass this test right here, biblically. This simple little definition. And one day while I was channel surfing, which is a very dangerous thing to do, it's more dangerous than just regular surfing, but... I came across a preacher there, and and she was glaring wild-eyed into the screen, you know, and kind of doing all kinds of stuff, and I turned it up a little bit. And here's the thing. She was interspersing English 
and something else. I don't know what it was. And here's the thing. None of the biblical tests were being passed there on many different levels. But no interpretation was given. And the English portions that I did understand, well, they weren't speaking anything other than condemnation, judgment. And the kids kind of freaked out. They were in the room and they were like, Dad, what was that? And I basically told them, kids, that is a tongue twister. <laughs> we're going to change the channel. Now, again, what is it? Our tongues were meant to bless. That's what the Bible teaches. If a, if a person has the gift of tongues, well, it can be a blessing to them and to God. And that's where Paul puts the emphasis. And that's why he says in verse 5, I wish you all spoke in tongues. It's not that he's down on the gift. He's not saying, hey, I'm a cessationist. Make sure we get rid of this thing. No, he's saying, you know what? It's a good thing in the right place. And so he says, desire the gifts. And it's okay to desire this gift. It's okay. But he says, those who have this gift, well, they, they will tell you that there's a special intimacy in their prayer life that maybe wasn't there before this gift was given. A spiritual connection that goes beyond maybe the confines of our brain. Because many people do have that kind of thing that they want God to fit in the little bitty box here. You know, if, if I can understand everything, then I'll accept it. But if I can't understand it, I don't want it. But many things about God certainly go far beyond my itty bitty brain. And so God, in the Bible, it says, it teaches that he gives a gift of a love language. And who doesn't need more intimacy in their communication with God. More of a sense of connection with God in their prayer life. Well, I don't know anyone who would say, oh, I've got that one all locked down. And so our tongues were meant to bless. But it's hard for speaking in tongues to bless anyone other than the speaker. See, it's saying in here, without interpretation, it just doesn't do anything for anybody except the person doing it. And whatever is done in the public church setting, this is such a great principle for us to understand should benefit everyone in the church. If it's done in the church, it should be for the church, not for someone's own gratification, not for somebody's own edification even. And the attention should be squarely on God. That's what we see in these passages. So Paul says in verse 6, But now, brethren, if I come to you speaking in tongues, what shall it profit you unless I speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by teaching? He's talking all about clear communication in their native tongue. He says, even things without life, whether flute or harp, when they make a sound, unless they make a distinction in the sounds, how will it be known what is piped or played for the trumpet if it makes an uncertain sound? Who will prepare himself for battle? And so, just a quick review. The first point, what was it? It's that our tongues can bless they were meant to bless. That's why God gave them to us. Whether speaking a supernatural language or a natural one, that's what he gave it to us for. But the second point, it's this. Our tongues can easily make a mess. Can make a mess out of the message. And you see Corinthian Christians there. They were tongue twisted very clearly. They were misusing the God-given gift of tongues. Again, it wasn't the problem with the gift that God gave. It was the problem with, was with the recipient and what they did with it. And regularly and randomly, they would be speaking out in these unknown languages that even they didn't know what they were saying. Nobody knew what they were saying. And Paul compares that in an analogy to saying that's like somebody just playing random notes on an instrument and calling it music. But it wouldn't be that, would it? And so you see, back in high school, I was a band geek. Now I'm just a geek. But back then, they called them band geeks. You know, that was in contrast to the sports folks and all the rest. And uh, so in the marching band, whenever we would have a guest uh, conductor or whatever, which did happen from time to time, my best friend played the trombone. And I didn't. I played the drums. But here's what we would do. We would switch. Okay, we would switch instruments because the substitute teacher doesn't know. And so there I'd be playing the trombone, you know, just making random notes, you know, and hitting people with it and all the rest. It's a very fun instrument, by the way. I uh, don't know how to play it still. But then my friend would be back there just banging away on the drums. You know, I just want to bang on the drum all day. That was him. But he didn't know what he's doing. And so the teacher must have been just very stressed. See, we were blessed, right? I mean, we're having the time of our lives. Yeah, this is fun to play on an instrument. I don't know. But while we were blessed, the teacher was stressed. 
And I think about it this way. We have a piano at our home. I'm not sure why still to this day because none of us really play it. But it makes a very interesting uh, piece of furniture. Uh, makes us look cultured. And our six-year-old <laughs> daughter, six-year-old, she's, she's no prodigy. Let me put it that way. Uh, but she has the time of her life banging on the old piano. I mean, just bang, bang. She edifies herself. Wee! You know, the song, bing, 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 bing. Look at my song, you know, and stuff. And I guess in some ways, as her father, I can look on and go, yeah, that's my daughter. She's, she's having a great time. But you know what? I'm really not edified. After a while, I'm like, I don't want to hear that song anymore. You know, that, that's a good song, but you just keep that one to yourself. And Paul's really using an analogy like that to say, you know what? Random notes are random words that don't make any sense. Well, they may be fun to play, but they're not fun for others to hear. And so we get to see just the very opposite example here tonight, right? We all enjoyed, I believe, the worship this evening because there are gifted musicians playing and singing clearly from the same sheet of music in the same key and singing it together and all that sort of thing. And Sherwin is the name of the guy who was leading tonight, if you didn't already know. But he not only speaks English, but he is Indian. And so he's fluent in an Indian dialect that I would guess very few of us here tonight know. Maybe a few. But I jokingly on the phone last night as we were talking, I told him, hey, why don't you just do the whole service in that Indian dialect? You know, why don't you just sing all the songs that way? And we won't put up the translation. We'll just put it up in that language. And, you know, we'll see how people sing along because it kind of fits in well with the teaching, right? <laughs> no, you guys would have, after about the first couple words, been going, man, I don't know to sit up, sit down, run out. I don't know what's going on, you know? And that's the whole thing. Paul's talking about a clear message. When we're together, that's the whole point. Verse 8, he talks about that clear call for an army, just making sure he's using all these analogies to drive home the point so no one can miss the message. You know, he's saying, you know, with a, if you're here with a military background, you know that there's different bugle calls, different calls that go to different things. You know, there's charge. Na, 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 you know, that's charge. And there's a one for retreat, and there's one for mess hall, and there's one for wake up, and all that kind of stuff. And what if the bugler's out there, and they don't know what's going on? Half the army's retreating, half of the army's charging, and the rest of the guys are going. I know that's two halves. That adds up to everybody. But okay, a third. I got tongue-tied. Okay, a third, a third, a third. Okay, a third charge, a third retreat, and a third are going to breakfast. And you go, you know, what's going on here? Got to have a clear call. And so you see in verse 9, he says, You likewise, unless you utter by the tongue words easy to understand, how will it be known what's spoken? You will be speaking into the air. Now again, Paul's goal was to be easy to understand, not to look spiritual, not for people to go, man, he's so deep, he's so incredible. No, his desire was that people would understand God's message clearly. A message, not a mess. Not something that people would go, wow, that was really... Uh, supernatural and spectacular, but rather that they would say, you know what, that hit my heart and my head and I understood what Paul was talking about. And sometimes Christians, especially Bible teachers I've found, being one and being around a lot of them, they, they feel this pressure sometimes to be profound. Like you've got to have some insight from the Scripture that no one's ever seen. If nobody's ever seen it, it's because it's not there. That's the whole thing so often. But you know what? People can try to make this great gulf, you know, between the speaker and the people. And man, I'm so spiritual. And if you guys just knew what an anointing I have and all these things. And you know what? Sometimes I go, that's not an anointing. That's just annoying. There's a difference. Do not touch the Lord's anointing, you know. W wait a minute. You know, have you ever thought, that person must be very, very spiritual and very, very smart because I have no idea what they said, you know, for the last 30 minutes. I don't understand it at all. But the reality is, in my life anyway, the teachers who have touched me most profoundly sometimes have said the most profound things very simply. Just, you know what, Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. And sometimes those are the very things that go, man, that person's right. And I understood that. And I needed to be reminded of that. And so verse 10, it says, There are, it may be, many kinds of languages in the world, and none of them's without significance. Therefore, if I don't know the meaning of a language, I will be a foreigner to him who speaks, and he who speaks will be a foreigner to me. Now, we all know that a common language builds a bridge like nothing else, and really, a uh, lack of language skills in that way or, or a commonality can be a real barrier, right? Now, when I was in college, I lived for a year in, 
in London going around uh, Europe by train at various breaks and all that kind of thing. And I've done a lot of travel in my life before and since, but this was really unique because I was totally by myself. The uh, friend that I was traveling with got sick, had to go back at the beginning of one of the trips, and I was all by myself there in Europe. And I don't speak one European language at all. Whatever you can imagine, you know, not even the dialects of England did I really understand. And so... Now, here's the thing. I would go for days without speaking anything to anyone other than omelette de fromage. That was the only thing I knew. If you, if you speak French, I think I came close to saying cheese omelette. You know, I ate a lot of cheese omelette, uh, une baguette. You know, that's, that's it. I ate bread and cheese omelettes. And somebody taught me the word hamon. And I got some ham in it. But they said, don't say habon. That's soap. All right, so, you know, you can get confused. But but here's the thing, I would go on these trains and there'd just be words swirling around me, none of which I understood. And I started to feel so isolated, so disconnected from everything because of this language barrier. And the thing was, I was surrounded by people, but I didn't feel connected to anyone. And at one point, I was walking along in an Italian uh, neighborhood and it was kind of funny this woman this older woman came out of her house and and she was yelling and she was waving her arms at me and all this kind of stuff just she looked very angry I can just put it that way you know she looked like she could have taken me down pretty bad and so I had really no idea what she was saying at all and and so I looked around quickly and I was thinking maybe she's yelling at someone else but there was no one else around and there I was and I I, I started stammering look I, I'm sorry no, no Italiano I don't speak uh, you know omelette du fromage you know or whatever <laughs> and, and she just started yelling even more and sternly and everything and I was really seriously getting ready to just make a run for it when all of a sudden this little dog ran right past me and into her house, and I just realized at that point, she's yelling at the dog, and not at me. <laughs> and it was all because I, lack, I lacked that language. I didn't understand what was going on. And I walked away thinking, man, this place is incredible. Even the dogs speak Italian here, and, and I don't. <laughs> They're so smart, you know. Now, later in that, in that same period of time in my life, I went to Moscow. And, and before I went, I didn't have time, really, or, or even gifting to learn Russian, but I did memorize the different sounds of the different alphabet letters, and it's a totally different alphabet than ours. So, you know, I could phonetically sound out words. I could walk around and see things and say the word, but I had no idea what I was saying. And I got to the hotel there, and they were, you know, very supervisory of us. It wasn't total freedom there, of course. And so, they assigned a, a guide to us, and, and it was a beautiful Russian guide, this lady, you know, and I was 20, I didn't know Lynn yet, don't, you know, don't start going there, but I was single, I, you know, all the rest, and I wanted to impress her with my language skills, you know, I wanted to show her that I had learned a little Russian and all this sort of thing, so I found this piece of paper in the hotel room, it was a nice little, you know, piece of paper, a nice lettering and on a phrase and all this stuff, and so I, I had no idea what it said, but I thought, man, it looks nice. Let me learn that. So I learned it. I practiced it. I practiced it. The next day I came up to her and I said, listen, um, I know a little Russian. I learned a little Russian last night. You want to hear it? And I was saying it in English, of course. And she said, sure, uh, uh, let's hear what you have to say. And I blah, 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 you know, said this thing. She cracked up. And I said, what did I say? She said, sanitized for your protection. <laughs> yeah, you found that in the bathroom, didn't you? Yeah, I found that in the bathroom. <laughs> it looked so nice. I thought... You know, but that's exactly Paul's point here is, you know, there's language just does something. And when it's not there, not much happens, you know. And, and verse 10, verse 11, a message becomes a mess if we don't speak the same language. That's what he's saying here. God can and will and does gift some believers with the ability to pray and praise him in a language they never learned the natural way. Didn't go study it and all the rest. Just God gives it to them. And the thing is, of course, God is never going to be in a situation where there's a language barrier. He, he understands every language, even the ones we don't. You're never going to find God saying, hmm, let me get my translation book. I don't get that, you know. But if I speak to you in a public place, the thing we need to do is speak in a language we both understand. And so that's using language to build a bridge, not a barrier. And on a purely natural level, this happens to me all the time here in the church in a very positive way. I'm one of the only staff members who is not fluently bilingual. You know, I, I am uh, the token gringo or one of them, you know. And so, 
if I'm involved or not involved in a certain meeting, you know, sometimes there'll be uh, a combination of, of English and Spanish and, and Spanglish and everything in between and all the rest. But then if I walk into the room, suddenly it'll switch to English, you know. Uh, and, and that's the thing. It's because of their love for me. It's because of their uh, courtesy to me that if I'm in the room, they know, hey, he's not going to understand this unless we switch it over to English. And if somebody in the room just throws out a Spanish phrase and everyone goes, ah! Well, there's what I call the laugh lag because someone will turn to me, give me the translation, and then I'm ah, by myself, you know. <laughs> but that's it. So if you're ever in this room and like 20 seconds from now, someone goes ha 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 over there, they're probably listening to the Spanish translation <laughs> of this. You know, that's what that's all about, the laugh lag. But this is what it's saying. You know what? It's just plain rude to exclude someone when you could include them. So why do that? Whether it's supernatural or natural, the principle applies. And so verse 12, even so, he says, since you're zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. And you know, in some Christian circles, there's so much peer pressure. There's so much of a misunderstanding here that people are reduced to ridiculous measures, really. You know, I, I, oh, wow, that's what it, it takes to be in here? Uh, well, I'd, I'd better fake it till I make it, you know? I, 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 uh, let's see. Simanu bowtie, Simanu bowtie, Simanu bowtie, Simanu bowtie. My mama bought a Honda. My mama bought a Honda. My, my mama bought a Honda. You know, and, and again, those are the things that you go, wait a minute. That's not it. Paul's saying if you're zealous for gifts, if you're really desiring gifts, Desire the gifts that are a blessing to everybody, that are the most blessing to everyone else. And if God wants to throw this in and bless you too, great. See, the supernatural is so impressive that sometimes people really want to go after that so that they can be looked upon as spiritual. And I remember I was at a grocery store. This will happen to you. I can almost guarantee you that sometime if you go to the same place I go. Because here's what happened. I'm at the checkout line. I guess the person saw in my check there's a little scripture there or something. They noticed it or whatever. And so I'm expecting this question, paper or plastic. And what I got was speaking tongues. I'm like, excuse me? You mean right now? Uh, is that a command or a question? And, and no, they're like, speak in tongues? You, you, you speak in tongues? I, uh, well, not here. And, and so, uh, paper or plan? I'd like paper, you know. Plan and so, they followed me kind of out to the car, you know, and they said, you know, if you're spirit-filled, you know, if you're, it, it, you can't even really be sure you're saved if you do not speak in tongues. You know what I did? I stuck my tongue out at them. No, I didn't do that. I didn't do that. That's tongue-in-cheek. I didn't do that. Okay. Now, in some Christian circles, again, that peer pressure, but not here, I pray, that you would ever have this sense of the haves and the have-nots or the do's and the do-nots or any of that kind of stuff. Listen, it's one of those things that you say, you know what, that's tongue-twisting. That's tongue-twisting. And that's so often arm-twisting and all the rest of that. That doesn't bless. That makes a mess. And that's not what the message of Jesus is all about for the church. So you see in verse 13, Therefore, let him who speaks in a tongue pray that he might interpret. If I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding's unfruitful. What's the conclusion then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with my understanding. I will sing with the Spirit. I will sing with the understanding. And I love that because what he's saying here, the summary of this section is this. In verse 15, he says, I'm going to be a balanced believer, and that's what I would want you to be. I will praise God with words that I understand, and when I run out of those, well, I pray that God will give me more words that I may be beyond my understanding, but that I would do both and want all that God has for me. To have the understanding, yeah, I want to understand what I'm doing, but you know what? I'm not going to understand everything about God. And so I will use every one of my natural capacities that God would give me to praise him and to serve him and to bless his people. And if he wants to give me supernatural capacities to do that within biblical guidelines, absolutely, I want that too. But I will use my tongue to bless and never to make a mess. That's what you're seeing in his thing here. And so often believers, of course, you might say, why would I even want this? Well, again, so often we'll think so hard about our words that we're picking you know, our fathereth, who arteth in heaveneth, hallowed be thy nameth. You know, Joe nameth, or whatever, but <laughs> thy nameth. And, and you're trying to pick the words, and you're not even thinking about God, not even connecting with God. And so sometimes God may give something that you say, man, I, I don't even know what I said there, but I sure know that God heard it. 
And so he says, otherwise, if you bless with the Spirit, how will he who occupies the place of the uninformed say amen at your giving of thanks? Since he doesn't understand what you say. For you indeed gave thanks well. God heard it, God understood it, but the others not edified. Now, what does this mean real practically for here? Well, this is what it means. If you pray with another person and you happen to have the gift of tongues, hold your tongue, bite your tongue. It, it doesn't, it's not the right time for it. Pray in a way that they can understand. Not in the tongue. Unless there's an interpretation, unless you have a relationship with that person where you can say, hey, I pray in tongues, would you like me to do that? Yeah, I would. And would you give me the interpretation so I can understand if you have that? And so verse 18, I thank my God that I speak in tongues more than you all. This is Paul speaking in verse 19. He says, yet in the church, I would rather speak five words. That's not very many. With my understanding that I may teach others also than 10,000 words in a tongue. Now, 10,000 was the largest number that the Greeks would write in their writings. And so he's saying as many words as you could possibly write or say, I would rather say five little words that make sense to someone than a thousand that do not. And brethren, don't be children in understanding. In malice, be babes. You know, be childlike, but not childish. In understanding, be mature. So Paul's saying, you know what? I do this, I just don't do it in the church. Why? Because in the church, my desire is to edify others, not myself. That's what he's talking about here. And he says in verse 21, verse 22, in the law it's written, with men of other tongues and other lips, I will speak to this people, and yet for all that, they will not hear me, says the Lord. That's a quote out of Isaiah. And it says, therefore, tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. But prophesying is not for unbelievers, but those who believe. Now, Paul was saying he wanted to be easy to understand. Unfortunately, in my estimation and many of the commentators, he, he fell a little short maybe here of being easy to understand. You kind of go, I don't exactly get what he's getting at. Well, let me just shorten it to say, as far as I can understand here, Paul seems to be saying, under special circumstances, and God lays some out here. Under special circumstances, speaking in tongues, it's done in a public proclamation way, as a sign, a miraculous proof to unbelievers. And you might know Acts chapter 2, verse 4. As you see this, it says they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. This is Pentecost. And it says they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And the disciples there are speaking in language they never learned. Remember, they're just unlearned Galilean fishermen. And you see them speaking in all kinds of languages that they never would have studied. And this is the key. It says the languages were understood by those standing around. They all said, we hear them speaking in our own tongues, in our own languages. Pretty verifiable there. It says the wonderful works of God. They're listening and going, how did Peter the fisherman learn that language? I don't remember him being in the language schools. And it says, if you'll look at it later, though, this is important. Peter preached a message then in Aramaic. That's what really cut to the heart. There was this speaking in tongues thing, but then there was a message that was so clear that the people said, what must we do to be saved? And he came out and told him. He didn't say, you got to do what we just did. He said, repent and believe. That's what you need to do. And so as you look at it later, you'll see all the way throughout the book of Acts, that's the real emphasis. Verse 23, therefore the whole church comes together in one place and all speak with, to with tongues. And there come in those who, if, if they come in those who are uninformed or unbelievers, will they not say, you guys are nuts. Now that's my translation. You guys are out of your mind. That's what an unbeliever would say if they came into chaos. But then he says in verse 24, all who prophesy, if all of, all of you prophesy, and an unbeliever or an uninformed person, somebody who is not really a biblical scholar, doesn't know anything about 1 Corinthians 12 through 13, 14, all that, but they come in, they're going to be convinced. They're going to be convicted. That's what you're going to see. And they're going to be converted. I love it. Convinced, convicted, converted. That's what's going to happen when there's a message instead of a mess. And you see, the secrets of the heart are revealed. And so falling down on their face, they will worship God and, and report that God is truly among you. Now again, just think it through in our day. Imagine a person coming in through those doors. It's their first time here. 
Maybe you're even one of those people here, a visitor, you know, somebody that somebody brought and all that. And you don't know the Lord, really. You don't really know the things of the Bible. You wouldn't consider yourself a follower of Christ. And we're just all sitting here randomly throwing out languages that nobody seems to understand. Nobody has a clue what anybody's doing, and it's just chaos. Now, you might stay for curiosity's sake. You know, you might say, man, this is crazy, man. <laughs> I love crazy stuff. This is better than anything South Beach has, man. I got to stay with this. This looks like a Christian crack house or something, you know. <laughs> People are out of it. You know, I'll have what they're having, whatever they're having. And here's the thing. He's really saying, you know what? Sometimes it's real easy to feel real spiritual in a place where you don't understand the message. You know, do it in another language. That way I don't have to be convinced, convicted, or converted. But he says, you know what? If a person comes into a meeting and there's scripture being taught and there's truth being told and the message is clear and the decision is plain and there's gifts being exercised in a biblical way, gifts like mercy, you know, people showing you mercy and hospitality and exhortation and love as he talked about that fruit of the Spirit here. You know what might happen at that point? I know what would happen at that point because it happens here day in and day out and week in and week out and month in and month out. You know what happens? Convincing, conviction, and conversion. Lives change. People come to Christ. People come to a life of faith and their marriages change and their families change and their lives change and their tongues change. See, my tongue changed a lot when I came to the Lord. Not so much speaking in tongues, but just stopping some of the things I used to say to my wife and to the world and to everything else. And so you see those things, you know what? Real people with a real relationship with God, the real God, that's what he's talking about here. When people see that, they see the supernatural very naturally. They come in contact with Christ without all the cloudiness of the Christian chaos that goes on so much. Because unfortunately, I feel very strongly about this, sometimes Christians make it very hard to come to Christ. Very hard. You have to come to Christ in spite of many Christians. Because they make a mess out of God's message. It wasn't meant to be that way. Verse 26. How is it then, brethren? He says, whenever you come together, each of you has a psalm, a teaching, a tongue, a revelation, an interpretation. He says, let all things be done for edification, for others, for building up. That's what he's talking about. He says, if anyone speaks in a tongue, let there be two or at the most three, each in turn. Let one interpret. A lot of guidelines here. He says, but... If there's no interpreter, let him keep silent in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. Remember, that's what it was all about anyway, that communication with God. Let two or three prophets speak. Let the others judge. You know, what do they judge by? Oh, I don't like the way you look. No, you judge it against the word of God. It was what he was saying, biblical. And so you see that he says, let them speak. Let them judge. Go home and do this. See if what I'm saying tonight lines up with what this says. But if anything is revealed to another, let the first one keep silent. You can all prophesy one by one, all learn and be encouraged. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. This is such a great verse here in verse 32. You have to see this one and make sure that it's marked in your Bible somehow. A question to consider for so many people as they hear about speaking tongues, they're like, oh no. I, I, I'm a little bit upset or, or afraid or anxious about this whole thing. You know, I've never done this. I don't know that I'd ever want to do it. Is it just going to happen to me? Is it like going to just take over me and, you know, and I'm going to get this weird look on my face and all the rest of that? No, here's the bottom line. If you don't want to do it, you will not do it. Why? Because God doesn't force anything on anyone. He doesn't say, oh, you know, here, take this gift and you must take it. No. He's not going to do that to somebody. He's not going to move your mouth against your will in another language any more than he would in your native language. He didn't force anyone to do anything. God is a God of choice, a God of freedom, a God of love, because love doesn't force itself on anyone. And so verse 32, all spiritual gifts remain subject to the control of the person exercising them. Oh yeah, God gives the gift, but he also gives the freedom to stir up that gift or not stir up that gift. And you'll never be ordering food at a restaurant, you know, and go, oh, no, we learned about this, you know, and they come out, would you like anything more? <laughs> what happened, you know? Well, well, you just ordered omelet du fromage or something. I don't know. <laughs> well, you know what? That's not going to happen. 
And people will say, oh, well, I, I saw that happen or whatever else. But you have to decide right now, what's your yardstick going to be? Experience? Oh, I saw it happen or somebody heard it happen. What does the Bible say? What does the Word say happens? And just because something has ex been an experience doesn't mean it was God's doing. And so, in a more practical sense, what does this mean to us as a church? Well, it just simply means that we do things decently and in order. And if a person stands up and blurts something out in the middle of a teaching, in the middle of a sharing of God's word, well, we know that is not really of God. You know, people use this excuse for excesses all the time. <laughs> I couldn't help myself. You know, the Spirit came upon me and over me and it just came out. The Holy Spirit made me do this. It's not biblical at all. It says here in 1 Corinthians 14.32 that if the Spirit is in control, He will give you self-control. Oh, see, it's kind of a funny misnomer in the, in the church world sometimes that the more in control the Holy Spirit is, the more out of control the people are. Not, not at all. The fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5.22 says, is self-control. The more controlled a person would be. That doesn't mean there isn't going to be supernatural stuff going on. But again, it's going to be done very naturally. It's going to be done very politely and all the rest. In control. I remember talking with a guy many years ago and he told me, man, I went to this Holy Spirit revival weekend. It was awesome, man. The Holy Spirit was really moving. I mean, the guy next to me got punched right in the nose. <laughs> I was like, oh yeah, the Spirit was moving, but I don't think it was the Holy Spirit, you know. There's an old saying that your freedom ends where my nose begins. And yeah, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. But not to punch a guy in the nose. What does that have to do with the Holy Spirit? And so he says, verse 33, God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as it is in all the churches of the saints. And then he says in verse 34, Let your women keep silent in the churches, for they're not permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive, as the law also says. And if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is shameful for women to speak in church. Well, we're all out of time, guys. There's nothing, <laughs> nothing to really say about that verse. <laughs> Ladies, if you want to know what this means, just go ask your husband at home. That's what it says. <laughs> Len, when we get home, we'll discuss it. I don't, I don't know what this means. No, it, it, I know what it doesn't mean. Paul is not saying that a woman can never open her mouth in a church at all, in any church setting, because he already talked about that back in chapter 11. In chapter 11, it said that women could prophesy and pray in the churches, and that was okay as long as there was a clear spirit of submission in them. And see, in that culture, the men would sit on one side, the ladies would sit on another side. And I know sometimes in church, you know, if you, hey, did you pick up the kids? You know, we'll whisper to them or whatever else. But if they're on opposite sides, it'd be, hey, honey, what are we getting for dinner? You know, I don't agree with what that guy just said, but uh, we'll be out of here soon. You know, that kind of thing. You'd have to call back and forth across. So he's just saying, look, there's chaos, there's confusion. Just ask them at home if you've got questions about what's going on in the teaching. It's shameful to be unsubmitted. And that's the thing. See, this more than a gender issue. This is really a spiritual issue as you look at it. Contextually, you'll see that. That it takes more of the Holy Spirit to hold your tongue sometimes than to speak <laughs> in tongues. And to be able to say, you know what, this is a time to stay silent rather than this is a time to talk. And the submission to authority, if you look at Ephesians 5, you know what, it's a male and female issue really. And so you'll see that uh, that's a sign of being filled with the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 5 talks about that. Be filled with the Holy Spirit, and it goes on to talk about submission in both men and women. And so if someone has a problem with submission, really, they don't have a problem with me, or they don't have a problem with Paul. They have a problem with God. That's the whole issue. They have a problem with God's Word. And so verse 36, is, he says that very thing. Did the Word of God originally come from you? Was it only you that it reached? You know, like the Corinthians are up there coming up with their own religion. He says, look, if anyone thinks he's a prophet or he's spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things I'm saying are God's commandments. But if anyone's ignorant, let him stay that way. You know, in other words, I'm not going to argue with somebody over this stuff. The Word of God is so clear that if you have a debate, you have it with God, not with me. He said, therefore, brethren, e eagerly desire, earnestly desire to prophesy, to speak forth, to prophesy, to speak forth God's truth, but don't forbid speaking in tongues. That's an interesting one for the cessationists. But let all things be done decently and in order. What a beautiful balance as we come to the last verse there in this chapter. 
Let all things be done decently and in order. That, that makes it so clear. I, I like to call this the 1440 filter. I like to use mnemonics and things like that so people can remember things because it's great to be able to go back and look at this later because it's one thing for us all to go, yeah, this makes perfect sense. And then you're going to be at the checkout line and some guy's going to say, speak in tongues. And you're going to go, oh no, where was that? 1440. 1 Corinthians 1440, the 1440 filter. You can put things through this as you see it in this church, in other churches, in your own life. And this is what it says. Let all things be done decently and in order. All things. And you know, I, I've said it many times. It, there's nothing worse than half a verse. And it seems like sometimes people like to look at one half of the truth and not the rest of it. But the first half, some churches seem to have this as a motto. Let all things be done. Yeah, <laughs> let all things be done, baby. We're going to do it all. And we're going to do it all now. And all that kind of stuff. Anything goes. Experience rules. Didn't have time to get the Bible. Woo! You know, we were having too much fun. And then you say, wait, that's chaos. But others only look at the second half of the verse. Decently and in order. And we got this God thing all figured out. We've got structures. We've got policies. We've got all of these things. We don't want anything here that we can't fully explain or understand. And they leave the supernatural out of the Christian life. And that's a huge mistake because this is a supernatural life. This is God living within you and through you. And you know what? You can look at some churches and say, man, where all the, are all the, the all things that are biblical? You know, everything's decent and in order, but where are the all things that Jesus himself promised to believers by the Holy Spirit. So if someone sees something supernatural in your life or in a church life or anything else, and they ask, man, what in the world's going on here? We ought to be able to say, well, this is what in the word is going on. Here's, here's what's happening. It's happening according to biblical guidelines. It's God's way of doing things. And if someone asks what this church believes and practices when it comes to speaking in tongues, let me give you this little tip. So it'll be on the tip of your tongue, okay? This is going to be the reminder. T-I-P, okay? Tip. Here, here they are. The first word, today. They're for today. Uh, we believe that. If someone says, do you believe in cessation? No, we do not. We believe all of God's gifts, according to God's guidelines, are given today, and until we see him face to face, we're going to need everything that he has for us as a church. So that's the first one, T. Then I, what's it mean? Interpretation. If there's no inter interpretation of tongues, speak the language everybody understands. If there is an interpretation of the tongue, it will be given praise unto God and people can be edified by hearing that in the third one, which is P, the right place, the right place. And again, I remind you, it's primarily private. He made that clear in here. If it would distract or confuse or divert attention away from what God is already doing and, and that would be the attention now, it's not the proper place. And we do have prayer meetings and other things where it's a more intimate environment and it, you know, for us in this room to do things one at a time and you, who, who has a word now? Chaos, confusion, it would make a mess of the message. So there are things that are very wonderful for our private lives. There are things that are great for a Christian to do in their own devotional life and I would encourage you, seek all that God has for you in the scripture everything that the Holy Spirit wants to do in your life. But that might be very disruptive and annoying and just confusing to Christians in a church meeting like this. And so the primary question that we always have to look at, again, that would be on the tip of your tongue as an answer. If somebody says, what do you believe? This is what we believe. If that's what you see in the Bible, it's certainly what we see. But the primary question in public worship is this, where is the attention going? Where's the glory going? Where is the mind of, and heart of the people. Well, see, it, it's very easy for people to get distracted and taken off of the message. And if you're in your house, you know, and you want to sprint and sing the praises of God in Swahili, naked in the shower even, man, that's okay. Go for it. God's seen you naked. He doesn't care. But you know, if you stand up here and woohoo, I'm going to do the same thing here. Guess what? Our nice ushers who handed you out that Bible and they're so sweet, man, they're going to be bouncers. They're going to bounce you right out of, it's going to be a bounce house. You know, you're going to bounce right out of God's house. That's the thing because Paul says, you know what? Pursue love. <laughs> Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts. But this is the point. Let all things be done decently and in order. And in doing that, we'll stay out of tongue trouble. And this is the thing will experience personally all that God has for us. But this is great. Our tongue can not only bless, and we've seen it can make a mess of the message, but that begs the question, what's the message? What's the main message? 
Well, there's one thing that every tongue, regardless of what language or languages that person does or does not speak, must do, the Bible says, and that's confess. Our tongue can bless, it can make a mess, but it must confess. That's what it really comes down to. The Bible says that every tongue will one day confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And the key question in our lives is when? When will you confess? Not will you, because you will. Everybody will. And you can either bow now or bow later. That's what the Bible says. If you bow now, if you confess now, it says that's under salvation, man. That's under eternal life. That's under every good gift that God wants for your life. But to do it later is simply to confess to condemnation, to confess, man, I was wrong. <laughs> and God was right. Jesus was right. But sadly, too late. And so maybe you're here tonight and you realize, even as this is maybe an unusual message on speaking in tongues, and, but you've seen that the Bible has clear answers even for confusing questions. And, and the thing is, you might realize, I don't have a personal relationship with God. I don't really have that connection, that intimacy that you were talking about, whether in English or any other language. I've really never confessed Jesus Christ as Lord. But I've been convinced as we've looked here, as you've seen what goes on here, as you've seen the kind of lives that change here. Maybe you've been convicted of some things along the way as the Holy Spirit does that in a person's life. And maybe tonight is your night to be converted. You see the things on TV, maybe, and I know I used that for an excuse for many years. You know, I didn't come to Christ because there's a bunch of crazies out there. Let me tell you, there are a lot of crazies out there, and there's getting to be more of them all the time. But here's the thing. If you think, man, you've got to be crazy to be a Christian, I would turn that around and say, man, you've got to be crazy not to be. You've got to be crazy not to be. God is offering eternal life as a free gift to a person. You say, yeah, but I'll be like one of those people. You don't need to be like one of those people. The message is very, very clear. Romans 10, 9. If you don't know it, you need to know it. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and this is key, you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you're going to be saved. You're going to be saved from sin, from the penalty of sin. You're going to have eternal life. See, man makes things so complicated, loves to do that, but God makes things so very simple. Confess, and you will be saved if you believe in your heart. And you know, we can all find fault with Christians. That's very easy. But even the enemies of Christ said, we find no fault in him at all. That's what Pontius Pilate said. Man, I examine this guy, I find no fault in him. So the thing is, is not, what do you think about Christians? Although that hopefully is an answer that you could give a better answer after seeing some real ones in your life and getting into close contact with him. But what do you think about Christ? See, Jesus wasn't weird or scary or doing those kind of things that so often we see in the name of Christ. I don't see that in the scripture, but I do see this. He was so very naturally supernatural and he had a way of just saying and putting his finger right on somebody's heart and speaking to their mind and to their heart and saying, now, why is it you won't come to me for life? <laughs> oh, uh, I guess it's hard to miss that message. You see, tonight there's no hype, there's no pressure, I pray. Just an opportunity, just what this scripture called a clear trumpet call, because the best use of my tongue right now is to tell you about the free offer of salvation that Jesus brings. And the best use of your tongue, if you've never done it before, is to confess him as Lord and Savior, to confess your sin and to confess your need for a Savior. So what we're going to do is we're going to close our eyes, we're going to bow our heads, we're going to pray. I'm going to ask the worship team uh, to come back up. And just in a very simple way, give you an opportunity to pray. You don't have to pray in tongues. You can pray in whatever language means something to you and connects you to Christ. Here's the thing. Don't be surprised if God blows your mind, though, and brings in things into your life that would change it forever. And maybe tonight you know a lot more than you've ever wanted to know. You didn't even have any questions on speaking in tongues, but you had other questions. What am I here for? The questions of life. What am I here for? What's going to happen to me when I die? What, what is the purpose of my life? Well, those things are only going to be found when you come into contact with the creator of your life, the sustainer of your life, Jesus Christ. All those answers are found in him. 
And you may say, I want to do that. I want to make that decision here tonight. And you may be asking, how? How do I do it? Well, at the end of this prayer, I'm just going to give you an opportunity to raise your hand. And by raising your hand, what you're saying is, I want Jesus. I want to confess Jesus as Lord here tonight. I want to confess my need for him. And I want to accept his gift that he offers to me of eternal life and everything that comes with that. And so let's pray. If you're a believer here tonight, pray for those who are not and maybe who hold or hang in that balance of wanting to make a decision but not sure they can do it. Father, I pray for those who are here tonight who know you and I thank you for that opportunity we have just to learn of your word. But right now, Lord, we turn our attention to the work that you said your Holy Spirit would do as you draw people to yourself. And if there's anyone here in this room who has not settled the issue of eternity, who has not just prayed that prayer of asking for forgiveness and for you to be the Lord and Savior of their life, to follow after you, Lord, I pray that they would do that now as we have this opportunity. With our heads still bowed, our eyes closed, if there's anyone here in this room and you know I'm talking to you right now, it's an offer that God is extending. It's not me giving it to you. It's God giving it to you. I'm going to ask you just wherever you're sitting to raise your hand right now and just say, that's me. I see you here. God bless you. Anybody else in the room? I see you over here. God bless you. Anyone else? Don't let the opportunity pass today to settle the issue of eternity, to know, hey, I'm heaven bound. I'm forgiven. I'm going to follow after Christ. Anybody else here who wants to make that decision? For you two who raised your hand, I'm just going to ask you to pray this prayer after me. It's a prayer of commitment to Christ. and Just mean it in your heart. Confess with your tongue here tonight. Jesus, I thank you for saving me, for dying for my sin. I thank you for giving me the gift of eternal life and for just promising to me all these things. And Lord, that you would fulfill these promises. Forgive me. Wash me clean. I want to follow you all the days of my life. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you. What we're going to do, the band's going to close out in a song, and I'm just going to ask the two of you who raised your hand as the band does begin to play to do what many others have done right here in this room. It's a bold step, but it's an important one in your life just to come to the front here and acknowledge your decision publicly. And the reason we ask you to do that, first of all, we want to meet with you and give you a Bible, give you a study guide that will help you get off on the right foot. But also, beyond that, we also want to give you an opportunity to put feet to your faith, to, to be doing something where you say, you know what, if I can't take a stand in front of the people here for the decision I've made, people who will cheer you on, well, there's no way you're going to be able to make that decision uh, public and real out there in the world when they're going to be against you. So the people here are for you. God is for you. And I'd invite you to make that step of faith as the band begins to play. I'll meet you right down here. God bless you.